thank, thank you for the invitation uh, uh, for presenting here at the forum. Um, I, I hope I, I um, get, get to convey to you about like what is the uh, the importance of the type of research that we're we, the, of the power electronics program here in Stanford. So um, everyone knows that like any electronic uh, system uh, depends on power. Uh, Tom uh, very eloquently. Um, indicates that like, so one of the issues that we need to resolve as we move to an economy that like, has trillion devices is how are we gonna power them? And uh, particularly, like one of the, the reasons I uh, became fascinated with power is because out of the frustration, as that you can see, like uh, the miniaturization of electronics was not followed by the, mi micro the miniaturization of power electronics. I remember in grad school, there was uh, uh, examples of of micro-mechanical uh, micro systems that were uh, building like motors and electric motors that were a uh, couple of millimeters on the side that were powered by uh, power supplies that occupied the size of a desk. And like that incredible difference between um, like the, the size of the, the electronics and like the, the size of that you actually needed was, was striking to me and I thought that it was a, 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 an interesting area to like investigate. So here uh, in this slide, I show a picture of a power converter that my, my students bought out of eBay. It's a conventional, not, not very exciting power supply. And you can see um, that when you account what occupies the space there, the size domina is dominated by heat sinks, uh, capacitors, inductors. And, and uh, the semiconductors do not really occupy that much space. It's just that the fact that you need to cool them that actually occupies may require some uh, consideration. And like one of the principal uh, um, uh, means that we have to miniaturize power electronics is by increasing switching frequency. Uh, to a first order, the size and value of the inductors and capacitors var va uh, varies inversely with switching frequency. So there's an interest in, of keep switching faster and faster and faster in switching pre pre frequency to bring the volume down. Um, so this being great, uh, with the advent of like better semiconductors, uh, silicon occupies a super important role in this part of the study. Uh, uh, semiconductor companies uh, like uh, they develop uh, switches that behave almost like ideally. And like even lately, there's the advent of two uh, important semiconductor, uh, wide band gap semiconductor technologies, uh, silicon carbide and gallium nitride, that promise like a new era of power electronics that we will enable to uh, increase switching frequencies uh, uh, many times to try to come up with a smaller and smaller power converters. And, uh, but, as we make power electronics smaller, it turns out that we find that it's also difficult to extract heat out of small places. And uh, so, so like if we want to miniaturize things, we better make them very, very efficient. And like unfortunately, um, I just mentioned that like this is true to first starter. In reality, there's other limitations. So um, I'd like to show this, this uh, example from a paper that was like published like about eight, eight years ago or so that shows uh, um, like at the time was a state of the art uh, power converters the power delivery was around 10 kilo, kilowatts or so. And like how the volume varies with uh, a switching frequency. So all the way to the left, you see a power supply um, operating at 72 kilohertz that achieves a power, de a power density of around four, four and a half kilowatts per liter. So um, as I mentioned, to try to improve the power density, we can just increase switching frequency. So uh, in this, paper, and they increase the switching frequency to 250 kilohertz to get a whopping 10 kilowatts per liter power density. Like, the system is much smaller, is uh, better in that regard. So then when you double the switching frequency again to 500 kilohertz, uh, the power density increases to 13 kilowatts per liter. But you start noticing that we're reaching a point of diminishing returns. Like, we doubled the switching frequency, but we didn't double the power density. So if uh, in the last example, in the last converter shown there on the right, like if we double the switching frequency again to one megahertz, which in power is not an easy thing to do, you notice that the power density barely moves to 14 kilowatts per liter. And it actually would be questionable if we were to double the switching frequency again, whether you would uh, gain any, any significant increase in power density. And like the question is like, why would we try to do that? And that's kind of where the things are. 
And among the reason is not the semiconductors necessarily, although they play a little role, is uh, in big part magnetics. So as I mentioned, like the, the, the inductors that you see in a power supply usually consist of magnetic core material. Uh, it's a ferrite of some sort. Uh, you put some winding ar around it. And they present very nonlinear losses that vary greatly with frequency. If you see right in the middle of that plot, I'm plotting um, core loss density versus uh, mag peak magnetic field density. You can see that like as you go uh, from a frequency of two megahertz on those purple dots to, um, to all the way to 20 megahertz in those like kind, kind of like red maroon bo uh, dots on the top plot, you see an increase of or, or almost like two orders of magnitude increasing power density loss. That makes it really, really hard to come up with a, uh, an argument that like going to higher switching frequency using magnet, magnetic material, it's, it's a good idea. And there's many other reasons why this is hard to do. You uh, suffer from proximity losses, uh, why, um, losses in your windings, as you probably um, may, may be aware, it turns out that current doesn't like to flow in conductors deeply at higher frequencies. It tends to, to, to remain in the surface, and that makes uh, the science uh, challenging. So what we are trying to do is kind of like um, recognize that like we, um, like the designs of like most what it's convention, what I call here conventional power electronics is shown in this plot on, the, on, the, on green. That like as we move in higher frequencies on the x-axis, we're going to get for some time an increase in power density, which is something that we want. Then as I showed you an example before, as we reach a frequency of a few hundreds of kilohertz or so, we reach this plateau in performance. There's no much gain in increasing switching frequency anymore. And because of the switching losses, losses in the magnetics and other, other issues, it turns out that if you keep increasing the frequency past a few megahertz, your power density actually goes in the wrong direction. Things do not get better at all. They actually get more worse. So what I'm proposing to do is actually, um, because it's fundamental that as you keep increasing switching frequency, the size of your inductor becomes smaller. So what I'm proposing is operate at even higher frequencies, even though maybe counterintuitive at first. But like the reason is that when you reach a frequency of few megahertz, the value of the inductors becomes so small that it actually becomes possible to uh, completely eliminate, eliminate the magnetic core and implement, implementing those inductors with a simple piece of wire. So there's of course gonna be a penalty, like the penalty is that you're gonna be at the bottom of that blue curve uh, starting a few megahertz and your power density won't be great at all. But like now you have no core losses at all that increases with frequency. And because it's still fundamentally true that as you keep increasing switching frequency, things become smaller, the only thing you have to do is increase the switching frequency a lot. So we're talking about like not uh, going, not only like two or three times higher in switching frequency, but we're talking about like switching frequency uh, 10, 20, 100 times faster, higher than what it's conventional. To give you an idea, like the switching uh, frequency of your uh, laptop adapter or your cell phone charger is probably a around 140 kilohertz. We're talking, again, like a couple of orders of magnitude increase in switching frequency. And because that enables us to, to use, uh, to eliminate magnetic cores together. And like one of the reasons I find that fascinating is because it opens the door for to the use of new fabrication techniques that academically are very interesting, but perhaps uh, offer uh, potential new applications. Essentially, what I'm trying to, to say here is that um, we can design a power supply that because now we don't have any magnetic components, uh, magnetic core components, we can make all the inductor as simple traces on a printer circuit board. So instead of having like inductors that you have to wind or a robot has to have to wind, you just like trace, you just made a little um, wires on a PCB and that's your inductor. And actually if you take advantage of uh, multi-layer PCB inductors, uh, um, PCB um, like design, you can actually make something that is pretty planar, it's very compact and hopefully very low cost. So, but in order to be able to do this, we really need to change the way we design circuits. Um, so here is a, an example of a very conventional switching converter that we use in, in my field. Um, and like, unfortunately, um, because semiconductors are not ideal, uh, we use them as switches in, 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 in my field. And um, 
they unfortunately take some time to turn on and turn off. And that overlap, uh, that time, the fact that like the transitions are not instantaneous, translate into switching energy loss and, and, and switching loss that um, increases with switching frequency. So if I were to increase the switching frequency, say, 10 times, my losses would be so enormous that things would start um, getting shiny and like start lighting up. Um, and this happens even with the use of the best of the best of uh, um, semiconductors, wide band gap semiconductors. This is a plot uh, that calculates the heat density that you would see in a device uh, versus switching frequency. And as you can see, when you reach a frequency of around one megahertz or so, the, the heat densities passing through the, 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 the device are starting to approach the, the heat density that you see at the surface of the so sun. And that's probably mean that your, your power converter will not be working well at that point. It'll, it'll shine though. So, um, so we need to, to, to change the design if, if we want to be able to operate at these frequencies of 10, 20, um, and higher megahertz. And the way they do, we do this is by uh, increasing the circuit complexity of the circuit a little bit. We can add more inductors and capacitors and, and, and uh, start shaping the voltages across the different uh, nodes in the circuit such that the voltage across the switch rings on its own up and down as it's shown in the plot over there in a way that like it becomes zero on its own by the time you have to turn the switch on again, essentially eliminating switching loss altogether. So that overlap that was uh, resulting in switching loss in, uh, in the example of the leg left is completely eliminated in the design that is shown on the right. So this is a great strategy to eliminate switching losses, but makes your design more complicated because now, it's, now you have what is pretty much a radio, a radio transmitter. And as a radio transmitter, you know that like if you change the frequency of your dial just a little bit, you may completely lose tuning and the performance will um, be horrendous. So it makes, it makes the design a little harder to achieve and um, uh, more dependent in parasitics and other, other, other issues. But as I mentioned, like we, we can take care of those uh, constraints in different ways. And one of the, uh, among those, those ways is fabrication. As I mentioned, one of the things that I find fascinating is that we can start implementing these inductors as simple pieces of wire, either laid out on a printed circuit board like the spiral shown in there, or a solenoid that is shown uh, here in, in, in the second figure. But unfortunately, like if you can imagine where all the magnetic fields that are produced by these inductors uh, they would occupy a space and probably reach places that you may not want them to reach. So instead what we do is we make these inductors uh, uh, using toroidal inductors inside a printed circuit board. We um, make a structure in the PCB in which the current flows in a way that all the magnetic flux remains in contained inside the, 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 the printed circuit board to prevent that uh, electromagnetic interference interference to make it uh, um, harming other electronics. And this is shown here in this uh, a picture that shows the magnetic field on top of the three structures that is shown on the left. And you can see uh, that in the figure on the right, the external magnetic field is much, much reduced when you lay it out in a way like looks in, in, in a structure that looks like a toroid. And, uh, and that's how we've been like designing power converters as of late. So we um, analyze the, the, the structure really well. We know where the, all the currents flow. We predict where the magnetic, fo uh, uh, magnetic fields are going to be. And we can come up with a design that like, uh, like the converter that is shown on the top right that uh, operates at a switching frequency of 27 megahertz. Again, several, um, much, much faster than your conventional electronics. And in this converter, all the passive components are either traces on a PCB, uh, uh, either surfaces or wires inside a PCB. There's no uh, discrete components other than the semiconductors. And this is a circuit that we wanted to demonstrate a power delivery of around 320 watts that has no magnetic core components, which means that like, provided that the uh, material handles it, it can operate at high temperatures, for example. And, uh, but one of the interesting things that we do is like, even though this is a type of design that we, we really like, it's far from ideal. So this is a, a, 
the schematic representation of these inductors that, that we're trying to make inside a printed circuit board. But unfortunately, once you actually build it uh, in a printed circuit board, the, the, the connections that um, connect the top and bottom surfaces is usually done using vias. And so these vias are the cylinders, uh, metallic cylinders that connect the top and that are shown in, the, in, in this figure. And, um, but that's far away from the perfect inductor on the left that, you, uh, that, that, that has solid walls to make those connections. And that's just the fact that we're dealing with like real, real manufacturing. But one of the things that we notice is like, because now we don't have the need of having magnetic material, it means that also perhaps we can take advantage of another technology that is kind of becoming popular nowadays, that is 3D printing. That we can actually consider using, um, even going farther from like the inductor that is shown here that has a, um, a, a rectangular cross section to something that has more smoother cur curves that presents actually lower loss and that is actually easier to print. So I'll take you through the, like, the design consideration of one of these inductors. So first we come up with the inductor that we would like to create in the computer. We analyze it in console, like in a FEM uh, program to uh, predict an inductance and a quality performance factor. And then we 3D print it in a very low cost uh, printer, it's a $3,000 printer that we have in the lab. We print a, a, a scaffold that unfortunately is not, not uh, conductive. So we just electroplate it to come up with a design that uh, uh, performs well in terms of the inductance that we predicted. Uh, it achieves the quality factors that we predicted as well. And it's very, very lightweight. In this case, it's less than a gram. So, but more interested at building components, because I don't think I'm gonna be in the business of building single components. We, we are kind of interested in whether it's possible to actually just 3D print converters all together. So we're coming up with design structures that like contain all the, all the passive components that you will need in one of these high frequency converters. Uh, and we 3D print a scaffold in this case, uh, the whole scaffold is 1.1 grams. Then when we plate it, it becomes a converter on its own. So this is a comparison of uh, this 3D printed, 3D printed converter and we compare it to a similar converter that we use, the PCV inductors, and we are able to shed 50% of the weight just by 3D printing. Um, as a terms of application, and why are you doing this kind of thing? This is actually to make a plasma torch. So this is a DC to RF generator that delivers 50 watts of power. Again, it weighs nothing. Uh, uh, it, it weighs like about five grams and delivers 50 watts very efficiently to ionize a, a, a gas, an inert gas, in this case argon, to turn it into a plasma that you can use for very, very cool things. What, what are those cool things, you may wonder? Satellite propulsion. So, uh, so one of the things that we very, very interesting is to see whether it's possible to, uh, to make these plasma thrusters so that we can miniaturize it in a way that we can feed them inside a CubeSat. CubeSat is a new platform of uh, satellites that only measures 10 centimeters on the side. And I'll just sh uh, show you one of the pictures of the one that we're building together, putting together. That like, uh, this is the size of the thruster. This is a collaboration that we have with the Australian National University in which we incorporated some of the techniques that I described uh, and we installed the avionics. So like, this is the whole thruster the, the, the plasma generator goes right through the middle of the board. And like we put it inside a satellite in a CubeSat and we're able to ionize plasma that we can use to propel these things in space. So this is important because a CubeSat usually is released a very low orbit and it still suffers from drag from the atmosphere. So like if you were to develop a, 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 a company that like wants to broadcast internet around the world for, uh, from a satellite using low, low earth uh, satellites, they're probably gonna be replaced very often. But if instead you're able to provide some sort of thrust, thruster, uh, you perhaps have a chance to keep them up, up there a little longer. So this is one, one of these efforts. And another, some of the work that we've been like, uh, working recently has been on developing uh, high, voltage, high voltage conversion. Particularly when um, in the power electronics field, we've been extraordinarily successful at making very small uh, power converters when, they, when you try to bring voltage down. But if you're interested in just doing the opposite, and why not? 
like the, the power density of high voltage converters is actually pretty dismal when, when you, you see at commercial units. So a lot of the work that we were doing in the lab is trying to see whether these high frequency techniques would enable us to make a, a very compact, very lightweight, high voltage converters. So and because I'm not gonna bore you with all the circuit strategy, I will just gonna tell you like the type of strategy that uh, allow us to, to, that we are able to use uh, using high frequency, allow us to cascade like a very large number of output stages in converters in a way that we can make high voltage converters uh, uh, very effectively. So this is a picture of a converter we just built uh, a couple of months ago. It's in a work zone funded by NASA in which the input voltage is 40 volts. The output voltage in this case is about two kilovolts at a, at a 50 watts output and it fits inside a one cubic inch volume. And to give you an idea where we stand here in power density compared to commercial, commercial units, we are here in the red spot in the middle of the figure. So we are uh, significantly better in terms of power density what is commercially achievable. We, one of my students just finished his PhD building a power supply that like um, it's competitive in terms of power density with another uh, commercial unit. The large power supply in the middle of, of this uh, slide, uh, it's a 250 watt, four kilovolt power supply that um, compared to the power supply that we build in our lab, which is about the size and thickness of around four credit cards. Uh, that because of the switching frequency has extraordinarily high um, uh, transient response. So, um, the transient response is about 100 times faster than anything that we have seen commercially. And we're trying to figure out how we can use this in, in, in interesting applications. So we've been investigating way to do this at much higher power. So this is, uh, again, a multi-kilovolt design, uh, two kilowatts of power that um, in terms of power density is really about an order of magnitude better than when it's achievable commercially nowadays. And you may ask, and why are you building these high voltage power converters? So we are currently building a 36 kilovolt unit that weights about this, uh, the, the similar weight of an iPhone 6. Um, we are trying to hit about 100 kilovolts uh, of voltage that we want to put inside X-ray tubes, X-ray systems for medical applications. So like depending on whether you're doing dental, dental X-rays or industrial X-rays, you may need like very significant high voltages and uh, naturally extraordinary amounts of power as it matters. So particularly the target application for this 100 kilovolt unit that we're trying to, uh, to make now is uh, to, to replace the power supplies that are currently sitting inside a CT scanner. So in a CT scanner, I hope you, uh, if you ever had uh, the misfortune to be inside of one of them, uh, you're, you have a, a machine that is spinning at enormous speeds, and like how fast that machine can spin depends on how heavy the power supplies are. And the power supplies that we can build are about like 30 or 40 times as more lighter than what you can currently buy commercially. So we want to see if this type of uh, applications would uh, enable to make uh, safer X-ray systems. And lastly, we've also been doing a lot of work on wireless power transfer. We, uh, last year, we finished a collaboration with four more companies to like evaluate um, how we can use wireless power transfer to, send, to, to power the loads that are currently sitting on, 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 on your electronics inside your, your door um, in, in electric vehicles. Like the, 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 the reason is every time you open the door, the, like the wires suffer some, some wear out, and after many, many times of doing that, they may suffer fatigue and damage. So we were uh, considering um, using coils that sitting in the hinge, hinges of your door. So it's a perfect opportunity because like the system becomes uh, self-aligned and like uh, it's able to deliver power quite efficiently. So there's already products that do that. So there's a system that operates at a frequency of 96 kilohertz and delivers uh, a couple of hundred watts at an uh, efficiency of 83% typical. Well, um, the system that we build, this is another commercial system. The system that we build leverages a lot of the computational uh, work and modeling that we did in my lab uh, to come up with a design that is very, very compact. It operates at 13 megahertz of switching frequency, which is a, a, 
a band that is sanctioned for operation in, in, in wireless. And it is able to deliver up to 300 watts uh, with an efficiency of 90.4% DC to DC uh, very efficiently and, uh, and it's actually quite small. And it's able to operate over, over uh, wide load range without loss in efficiency. And with that, thank you very much and I'm happy to take any questions. So thank you, Juan, for the nice presentation. Uh, you showed the EMI uh, results from uh -huh. simulation. Have you compared it to the actual measurements to see that that's really the amount of EMI that you will get? So, um, so I didn't show it here, but like we we actually have done the uh, testing. So we're operating um, in bands. So the selection of frequency has a lot to do in what you're able. To uh, to, to actually frequencies that you're able to operate. Uh, we're opera uh, we tend to operate in ISM bands. These are for inst instruments, scientific and medical. And these are frequencies at 13.56 megahertz, 27.12, uh, uh, 40.68, whatever. And like uh, these frequencies, there is um, allowances for operation that you can uh, broad broadcast as much more significant power without affecting our nearby units. And um, so that's one of the reasons that we, we do. Like the type of topologies that we use are highly resonant and very well um, tuned, and we do not produce significant amount of harmonics. And like the, um, a lot of the techniques that we use in our design, let's see, go, go back a little bit. So by, um, Inside, inside some of the converters um, that, that we build, see, it was more than I thought. Um, so in some of the converters that we built, this one. So even we try to use, as I mentioned, toroidal inductors, because they tend to confine the power, the, the magnetic flux to be inside the turrets. But there is still a, a small component of magnetic field that leaks out. We take care of that by actually placing, instead of a single inductor, we actually place two inductors like the one shown in the left, in which we make the current flow in opposite directions to cancel the, the, the external contribution of that field. Uh, so we can do that in all the components that are part of our power supply. We cannot do that in the, one, in the coils that are using wireless power transfer system. For that, you really, because that's exposed to air, that's the whole point. So for, those, uh, for, that, for that reason, we have to operate at a frequency that we sanction such that we can actually uh, operate uh, uh, well. So we have actually have measured the, the, the electromagnetic uh, fields in the vicinity, and they are small, very small. Um, we do not have the facilities, at least in my lab, to do formal testing for EMI, but I'm not, I'm not worried about not being able to meet those considerations. <laughs> 